grammatical mistakes. A comma splice is when you join two independent clauses together without placing the appropriate word to join them. Okay, so an example, this is from Shaquille O'Neal. I use a couple of examples from Shaquille O'Neal because he's ridiculous. Um, he said, and this is a direct quote, I am the number one ninja. I have killed all the shoguns in front of me. He creates a comma slice with the comma in between two independent clauses. So how do you fix a comma slice? There are four ways to do so. The first one is the easiest. You just replace the comma with a period. So you say these two sentences are independent clauses. They can stand on their own. I will separate them with a period. Sometimes the sentences will seem abrupt, placed next to one another, but it is the easiest thing to do to fix your comma splice. The second solution for a comma splice is to use a semicolon. Now a semicolon is a stylistically savvy punctuation point. What it does is it suggests that there is a relationship between these two independent clauses, that they're related in some thematic or profound way. So instead of putting in a period, you put in a semicolon. So I am the number one ninja, semicolon, I have killed all the shoguns in front of me. You're suggesting that there's a relationship between being a number one ninja and killing all of the shoguns. At the end of this class, can somebody explain what a shogun is? Mm -hmm. Solution number three is use a coordinating conjunction. Remember at the beginning of the seminar, I talked about what a conjunction was. It's a word that joins two words, a phrase, a clause, or a sentence together. So. You can indicate, through a coordinating conjunction, a logical connection between these two independent clauses. So, I am the number one ninja, and I have killed all the shoguns in front of me. So there are seven coordinating conjunctions. They include and, but, or, nor, for, so, and yet. So you add a coordinating conjunction to suggest a logical relationship between being a ninja and killing shoguns. Now, the fourth solution is using a conjunction that is a subordinating conjunction. Rather than a coordinating conjunction that says these two things are related equally, you say one thing is related to the other. You create a dependent clause and an independent clause. So, since I have killed all the shoguns in front of me, comma, I am the number one ninja. Where is the dependent clause here? Dependent? Since. Since. Since, exactly. So you've put in a dependent marker word, since. So since I have killed all the shoguns in front of me creates a dependent clause. It no longer can stand on its own. It requires the independent clause to give it meaning. How not to fix a comma splice. But if you create something that uses therefore, nevertheless, furthermore, moreover, etc., you still have a comma splice if you say, I have killed all the shoguns in front of me, comma, therefore, I am the number one ninja. You still have a comma splice because the comma is joining two independent clauses. Therefore is an independent marker word, right? If you say, therefore, I am the number one ninja, that is an independent clause. So be aware of that. A run-on sentence has some of the similar problems of a comma slice. A run-on sentence is when you have two or more independent clauses joined together with nothing so that they exist in the same sentence. So another Shaquille O'Neal quote, when I'm done playing, I plan on going undercover. I want to be a sheriff or chief of police somewhere like Miami or Orlando. Which makes me laugh because I can't imagine Shaquille O'Neal ever going undercover. <laughs> so what you have here is you have two independent clauses that are joined together with no punctuation and no coordinating conjunctions. You can use the same strategies as you fix a comma splice to fix a run-on sentence.
A split infinitive is what happens when you put an adverb, right, a descriptive word that is connected to a verb between to and the verb that you're using. Now, what's wrong with a split infinitive? Grammarians have huge controversial debates about whether to split or not to split an infinitive. It happens a lot. People have been splitting infinitives for centuries. It happens in common speech, in oral communication all the time. And you can decide, based on your own development of your critical voice, of your writing voice, whether to split or not to split an infinitive. In formal writing, people get a little bit more upset about split infinitives, so just be aware of the relationship between to, your adverb, and your verb, but I leave it up to you. Dangling modifiers. You do not want your modifier to dangle. A dangling modifier is a word or a phrase, usually at the start of a sentence, that does not connect properly to the independent clause, to the thing that you're describing. So I'll give you an example through LeBron James. Tempted by Miami's offer, which is a dependent clause, LeBron James's loyalty to Cleveland is overruled by his ambition. So if you think about a dangling modifier as something that um, the two things don't correspond, what is wrong with this sentence? Tempted by Miami's offer, comma, LeBron James's loyalty to Cleveland is overruled by his ambition. Who is being tempted in this sentence? Or what is being tempted in this sentence? Loyalty. Loyalty. Exactly. And loyalty actually can't be tempted. You can't personify loyalty. It's in fact LeBron James who is tempted, not loyalty. Hence the dangling modifier. So you can change that to make sure that both of those dependent and independent ideas are connected. So you can say, Tempted by Miami's offer, LeBron James allows his loyalty to be overruled by his ambition. It makes the two ideas correspond. So pay attention to your dangling modifiers. All right, I'm going to talk now about words that are easily and often confused, both in written and in spoken communication. And one of those is the difference between that and which. That and which are not interchangeable. They mean two different things. So that defines. It is part of an independent clause. Which gives extra information, so it's part of a dependent clause. So I'll give you an example. Pardon the interruption, which I watch every day, is the sportscast that I enjoy above all others. Where is the dependent clause in this sentence? If I said, pardon the interruption, is the sportscast that I enjoy above all others, that's an independent clause that stands on its own. The thing that I enjoy above all others is defined by that. You could take out which I watch every day without losing any of the integrity of the idea. So which adds additional information. It creates a dependent clause. Bring versus take. This guy is taking one in his face as we speak. This is what I actually still have to think about in my spoken language. Whether you use bring or take depends on your point of reference to the action. You bring things here and you take things there. One of the memory devices I use is take there. They both start with T. I'm going to ask Ron McLean to bring Don Cherry to my Halloween party. But Ron would call Don and say, Don, may I take you to Dr. Adele's party? I'm at home. I am wanting them to come to me. Okay, so bring Don Cherry to me. Ron McLean is not yet at the party, so he will take Don Cherry with him to me. 
So it's the location where you are in relationship to where that object, or in this case Don Cherry, is going to go. Few versus less. The basic rule is you use less when you've got mass nouns and fewer when you have count nouns. Okay, what's a mass noun and what is a count noun? A count noun is literally something you can count. It's things that you can say there's one of you, two of you, three of you. So if you're watching rugby, I can see a ball, I can see players, and I can see fans. I can count all of those, so they are count nouns. So France had fewer fans than New Zealand in the World Cup final. Look at these all blacks, they're pretty fierce. You can count the fans, so you use fewer. If you have a mass noun, a mass noun is something that you can't count individually. Um, so if you, again, are watching rugby and you watch bloodshed and violence, you can't actually count bloodshed and violence. So you say, if there was less violence in rugby, it wouldn't be as entertaining. You can't count bloodshed. You can't pluralize it. You can't say, I watched bloodsheds and violences. So they are mass nouns rather than count nouns. And it determines whether you use fewer or less. Me versus I. This is a very common grammatical mistake. People often use I because it sounds more formal and more sophisticated. So Obama is actually guilty of using the I when he should be using the me. So I is the first person singular subject pronoun. That's a very lengthy description for one letter. What does that mean? I will be performing the action of the verb. Okay, so I want to go to the lacrosse game. You and I need to get ready. Don Cherry and I are going together. You use I because the I is doing the verb. You use me as an object pronoun. So it is what the action is doing to you rather than you are doing the action. So Don Cherry told me to cheer for McGill. He gave me a hundred dollars. Between you and me, I cheered for bishops. So me is what the action is doing to me. I is when I'm doing the action. The best thing that I can tell you about writing is don't get hung up on the discipline of punctuation and word choice when you got your first draft. Do a free writing. Put everything you possibly are thinking onto the page. Type it out, write it out, depending on what your style is. Put it all there first. I like to call that the raw material. You've got your big stone of granite. And then in your revision process, you go and you use your chisel and you chip out the outline and you polish it and you refine it. So it's an ongoing process. Don't leave it to the last minute because the night before, you're just giving me the raw material. And if you don't give yourself enough time to shape that and to make sense of it and to give it coherence, then you're going to get a mark that reflects the raw material rather than the force of your arguments. So even if you are coming up with something profound and exciting and new, you haven't given it the shape that your reader will really understand the importance of the ideas that you're conveying.